Hello everyone, uh, very good afternoon. I am Sajan from uh, Intuit, who work as an engineer in the operations team. Um, I lead the operations initi initiatives uh, for Mint, and I have uh, Linu with me, he is another engineer. Uh, he uh, leads the development initiatives uh, for Mint. Today, uh, we are talking about moving Mint to AWS, some of the some of the important memories that we had while we moved Mint to AWS. Uh, for people who uh, don't know about Mint, Mint is actually uh, the largest financial, personal finance uh, SaaS, which serves uh, customers in the US and Canada. And we are almost uh, on all the major platforms like mobile devices, webs, and desktop. And we have around 22 million users. 70 terabyte of financial data and around 20k uh, FI support uh, as of now. While talking about Mint, I uh, would like to walk you through uh, a high level view of Mint. We have a typical three tier architecture, which is the web, app, and data. And uh, the communication between each component happens through uh, the central messaging system. Um, that, that's about it. That's, that's a, one difference that we see from a typical um, three-tier architecture and Mint. We call the entire uh, architecture as a pod or a SIM line, and we have several SIM lines which constitutes the complete Mint, and which is under a load balancer. Um, while talking about moving to, ma moving to AWS, what uh, really motivated us is nothing really different from what everyone had while they moved to AWS. But a couple of things that made more sense to us were the high availability and disaster recovery which we wanted to have, which we didn't have in our physical data center. And the second thing is uh, scale uh, as much as you want uh, uh, within, within minutes. And the other thing that we thought about is the automation possibilities that we can have when we move to a uh, virtual infrastructure like AWS. So uh, I would like to talk about some of the uh, experiences that we had when we moved Mint to AWS. Some of the failures that we had, some of the surprises that we had, and some of the learnings again. Uh, so Mint, Intuit as a company over the 30 years uh, gained a lot of trust from their customers, which is something which we cannot compromise. And that's what we thought about when we moved, uh, when we were about to move Mint to AWS. And we decided that security is a prime concern for us while we move uh, financial data to a public cloud platform. We have done a couple of things uh, apart from what uh, AWS gives as a standard to every other customer. And a couple of them are uh, a network encryption that we have done, like uh, any data or communication travels the network is encrypted. So between instances, the communication, whatever is happening is actually encrypted, and it, which uh, pre prevents network snooping. And the other thing that we have done is application encryption. What does that mean is uh, the data what we have uh, in database is stored after encryption from the application layer before storing into databases. So all the sensitive fields in a um, database is encrypted, which means even a database engineer cannot get sensitive data in plain text from database. The other thing that we have done is uh, storage encryption. So whatever storage that it is, maybe an ephemeral storage or an EBS volume, we encrypt them, bef we encrypt them before we use it for a storage. So the ephemeral storage that we have or the EBS volume that we have are encrypted before we store it, and we are using dmcrypt for encrypting that, which means it's uh, at the block level. All these three means the plain text data that we have in our instances are only kept in the memory. And then what we have done is to make sure that we are not compromised there, we wipe out the memory before we give the instances back to the AWS pool, which means there is nothing in the memory while we give the memory back to the AWS pool. Right? All these encryptions made another big problem for us, which is nothing but managing the secrets. So we, do, we use a lot of secrets which are very uh, uh, 
which are really independent of from system to system it changes so we had a lot of secrets and we know we wanted to store it in a secure way that was another concern and then we came up with another service called intuit secret service which is actually a combination of uh, the key management system that aws offers and some of the um, intuit specific uh, services which make sure the the secrets are securely stored secrets are uh, they they allow us to t uh, retrieve the secrets in plain text in a secure way after verification of the instances which uh, which asks for secrets and all that so the other thing uh, what during the journey what we found is like all these encryption overheads and all that will be, when we moved uh, mint to aws introduced a lot of latency the one reason why we had a high latency in aws was uh, the latency due to the encryption that we have and the second thing was because of the cross availability zone communication which means our instances for the ha purpose are span across multiple availability zones which means the webs if you have 10 webs the 10 webs are span across three availability zones uh, equally which means 3 3 4 or something like that so uh, when the communication happen uh, from component to component what will happen is uh, uh, the communication is going across the availability zones which are like maybe 40 miles apart from each other so that added up some latency in there the uh, so what we have done for this is we worked out on the ca uh, caching mechanism that we have in, uh, in our in, uh, in our application and the friend and latency we have done a lot of work over there and then reduce the latency uh, significantly to make sure that even after moving to AWS with a lot of encryption, we are not uh, compromised on the OPEX metrics that we have uh, on SLAs. The other thing uh, that uh, made a higher latency was the wrong selection of instance types and application configuration. So when we moved Mint from uh, a physical conventional data center, uh, which has a, a huge amount of RAM, the beasts, uh, where uh, Mint was, uh, uh, Mint was on. We moved from there to a horizontally scalable smaller instances in AWS, which made us, which, uh, which uh, made a lot of latency because the applications didn't work the way we wanted because it had a different configuration. So we had to trial and error with the configuration and the Mint uh, and the instance types to make sure that uh, Mint is hosted on, on AWS properly. Let's uh, talk about some of the other challenges that we had, which maybe. Uh, a challenge for everyone who has a big amount of data. So we had then around 60 terabyte of data while we planned to move Mint to AWS. And uh, it, was a, it was a question how we move this, uh, this much amount of financial data uh, to AWS. And then what we desire, we have tried multiple things, but uh, a lot of them did not work well. And then we tried to use uh, the a AWS import export job to move data physically from our data center in Sunnyvale to AWS data centers. Um, we moved 60 terabyte of data in different sets uh, to make sure that our databases comes up and replicate with the masters in, uh, in the physical data center uh, before the data gets stale because you have to have the bin logs. Again, we are using MySQL. We, we, we wanted to make sure that the data get, does not get stale before the databases in uh, AWS comes up. The other problem that we had then was we still failed in getting the data properly on AWS uh, with AWS import export job because a couple of shards that we had became stale and then what we did is we had to use a different mechanism to move over the wire. Um, the, we tried different things like Netcat, rsync and all that and then Tsunami worked well for us which is working over a UDP protocol. Um, Can I take the questions after that? I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, then the um, cost surprises that we had. So uh, we also took a way where we want we don't care about the cost, and then we moved Mint and made it on the on AWS. After that, we decided we should optimize on cost because our uh, director was falling down from a seat all the time because of the cost that he get. Every so what we have done uh, uh, initially was to try out with our instance types and all that, but it didn't work really well for us because we had uh, already uh, done a lot of optimization there uh, by the time we moved to AWS. But the most chunk of uh, bill that came to us was from ABS and the IOPS that we were using, which uh, mostly uh, we didn't care about. 
So we were, we were really over allocating our databases um, uh, while we moved to AWS and we were using around one terabyte of uh, EBS volumes or every other shard. And then we optimized there uh, to make sure that our data, our databases, uh, uh, storage allocation is just above the actual utilization. And then we automated that to make sure that it dynamic the data, uh, allocate the storage space when, when it is required. And the other thing was uh, the IOPS optimization that we have done, uh, because the IOPS optimization was also another factor because we were over allocating there. And then we uh, dynamically uh, allocated uh, or adjusted the uh, IOPS, looking at the historical utilization of IOPS per EBS volumes. And we have done one more thing there, which was separating the read-write to IOPS, to, to EBS volumes. Um, so what we have done is uh, we identified what read and write should be there on an EBS volume which are required, and the, all other things have been moved to the ephemeral storage that we have. So for example, the log files and all that have been moved to uh, an ephemeral storage which does not use the IOPS of uh, the uh, EBS volume. The other thing that everyone does is clean up the infrastructure aggressively, so make sure that nothing is uh, lying around which are not in use and things like that. So uh, ABS snapshots, ABS volumes, instances, test uh, stacks, everything gets deleted um, upon our retention policy and things like that. And plan for uh, reserved instances. Um, so look at the usage that you have and then make sure that you uh, use the reserved instances uh, wherever you can. But into it uh, for the security reasons are not using reserved instances, but we are using dedicated reserved instances, which means um, on any availability zone you have a set of hypervisors which are dedicated to you, but that's a risk as well because your instances can go into the same hypervisor, um, multiple instances can, into the, can go into the same hypervisor, and if that hypervisor has a hardware issue, then uh, all of the instances that you have on that instance is getting affected. So you'll have to um, take care of that when you when you decide to go for dedicated reserved instances. Let's uh, talk about some of the implementation that we have done maybe differently uh, while we moved uh, to AWS. So uh, one of them uh, is actually the AWS services that we are using. So what happened? Uh, so we we are also using a lot of AWS services as what uh, everyone does. But a couple of things that we have done, uh, as I said, maybe differently is. Uh, usage of API of AWS. So what we were doing initially was uh, we, whenever the instance comes up, we wanted uh, some of the metadata from the AWS API, which is given by, uh, which, which, which required to make sure that our instances are coming up and then talking to other, each other properly. But um, we were using directly, uh, we, are, we were calling AWS APIs directly, and then what ended up in happening is we got throttled big time, because whenever the instances comes up um, um, in a huge number, um, AWS started throttling us, and then the other problem happened is like, AWS API calls are really expensive in terms of time. And uh, if the instances started calling the AWS APIs when it comes up, the bootstrap time for each instance um, significantly uh, um, was really high, and then we couldn't get our infrastructure up in the way we wanted. And then what we decided is um, we uh, created an internal API which exposes the data from um, that to all the instances under that. What it does is it calls AWS API on an interval and then uh, caches data, uh, actually a superset of data, which is the only data required for our instances to come up. And that API, we, our instances, when it comes up, calls that API and gets the data and then start booting up, which means all the data is there in one call and then which is really not expensive because it's an internal API that we have. And then our instances got a lesser bootstrap time. That's, that's one thing that we have done. The other thing that we have used is AWS tagging. Um, uh, in a different way, what we have done is we, we started tagging all our instances um, uh, in a way that um, we have a different, completely independent min stack in a single, uh, a multiple number of independent uh, min stack in the same VPC, which we call it as endpoints. So endpoints are nothing but completely independent min, min stacks from data to the presentation tier, which uh, talks to each other, but uh, 
uh, uh, communication from one endpoint to other endpoint is not possible. So for example, as, a, as an engineer, I want a test stack. I can, I can create a test stack as Sajan, and then another person can uh, create another test stack uh, A or something minus uh, independent of the A stack, whatever he has created. So that's uh, one thing we have done differently. The, uh, let me talk something about the bootstrap and stack, stack creation that we follow in, uh, into it especially for Mint. We use a uh, cloud formation template to describe our instances, and then we have a uh, infrastructure code creation mechanism, which is completely a config-driven one, which means um, we can create any uh, type of stack with different um, configuration and input uh, to create our stacks, uh, to create the cl cloud formation templates, which means we are not hard coding or cre keeping the cloud formation templates as such in our infrastructure to create our stacks, and which made uh, the infrastructure code scalable and reusable for any other platform with a couple of changes that we have. The other thing is we use uh, AWS metadata, AWS tagging as, uh, as a metadata as well as I said uh, in the last slide. So that is also used in cloud formation template uh, while we create the cloud formation template. And then, uh, thanks to Mike who came and talked, we use salt stack extensively to create uh, our infrastructure. We, the one thing that we found there is uh, everything in cloud is dynamic and then especially for security reasons, Intuit has a very dynamic secret strategy as well. So there is no hard coding in um, cloud formation or uh, in any bootstrap script or configuration file. For example, if you want to talk to your databases, you don't have the password right away. When it comes up, it calls the Intuit secret service and gets the uh, passwords. Uh, and which is, uh, if you have 100 databases, 100 passwords. So you have to create all the configuration files on the go, which, uh, which, is, which is what I meant by um, everything dynamic. The other, th yeah, dynamic secrets is other thing. So we have uh, 100 shards, 100 passwords. So uh, for example, how we set passwords for our databases. When the databases comes up, it calls into your secret service, get all the, se all the secrets that it needs, and then um, we expose it as salt pillar data, and uh, we use it to create all the bootstrap scripts, and then bootstrap scripts uh, uh, dynamically go and uh, set the passwords for each database, and which is the same thing we do for our application as well to talk to uh, the database, which means there is no password to which we know. Nobody knows the password. Something that we have done with um, infrastructure code, how we man managed to get uh, testing for infrastructure code, which may be uh, a little different from people does, or maybe how we do a salt um, in our infrastructure is uh, not a master and minion method. We check out the code to the instances and uh, and uh, call assault local, which means the configuration is locally available, and we call salt and then we do uh, we um, uh, bootstrap our instance. Which means, uh, as an engineer, I want to test my branch. Uh, I create uh, the infrastructure from my branch, and the infrastructure creation code will uh, tell the bootstrap script that you know you have to check out uh, the the uh, branch which I am using to create the stack and the same git sha that you have to use. And then it checks out that and uh, start creating, which means uh, everybody can um, create their own stacks and then test their own infrastructure code, whatever they have written before they check into master. And then for the deployment, what we do is uh, we identify the deployment candidate after we uh, deploy it to the end-to-end -end environment, which is a testing environment that we have. And um, the, uh, we, we, if, if we say that everything is fine with the infrastructure code, we, ta we, we branch it and we tag it. Uh, we use a git tag and then we use a git tag to create the deployment. And then for any hotfix within that deployment, we create another tag. Actually, the, the hotfix for the infrastructure is going in there, that, that uh, branch itself and then merge back to master. So we can move uh, back and forth in the deployment as well. Now, the last one is uh, the high availability strategy that we have. Uh, we are using multi-availability zone instead of multi-region. The reason why we went for multi-availability zone instead of region is nothing but uh, the, the operational hassles that we have when we go for multi-region. The main reason is 
to make your data available in different uh, regions, which is really difficult, and um, operationally that, that has a lot of problems. So what we tried uh, during this journey was to, uh, to basically uh, balance operability, uh, high availability, and reliability. So that's that's what that's what we've uh, we've tried. So that's one reason why we didn't go for multi-region, and then, and of course it, it's it's uh, in a lesser cost uh, while you compare with uh, multi uh, availability zone. And the other reason why we went for multi availability zone is because some uh, times um, multi availability zone within the same region is more reliable than uh, multi region for different reasons. And then Amazon is hosted on AWS the same way, multi-availability zone instead of multi-region. So um, there are a couple of reasons why, we, uh, why, why it is uh, high available than multi-region. Um, multi-region um, hosting, um, whereas multi-availability zone is uh, lesser cost, easy to handle, and then it is highly available. So that's the end of the talk, and uh, I am opening for QA. And um, if you have any dev specific questions or something, I have uh, Linu here who can give you a better uh, details. Um, hey. Okay, Tsunami is actually a UDP protocol. Uh, it, it, it's a um, uh, over the wire transfer protocol. Uh, a UDP protocol is used, and then it has an aggregator at the w one end, and then it, it emits uh, the data in, in, in different formats and doesn't wait for uh, a response back like TCP. So what happens is like the data gets there, and then the aggregator makes sure that the data is complete. So it is faster than that. What? Well, we didn't find any loss, actually. So that, that worked well for us. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that uh, for testing your infrastructure, mm -hmm. there's any branch that anyone can check out and then can uh, can bootstrap the uh, the whole infrastructure and test it. So for testing that bit, did you have any automation around it, or was that testing manual? Well, uh, the so th there are two things, right? One is actually the build testing and the infrastructure code testing. So uh, there is one automation which is uh, which which we have for uh, testing infrastructure code automatically and uh, uh, the build automatically. So the build one is completely automated. Infrastructure code change is completely DevOps specific. And uh, uh, so, for example, I'm an engineer. I want to test my infrastructure code, uh, which is which is on my branch. I create the stack and then, then test it. So testing is completely automated, but what you want to test is the question. So what are the changes that you do on infrastructure code? I don't have a unit test for that. So you have to do it uh, in a way you want. So, so we do two types of testing. One thing is the infrastructure code level testing, which is ops does, and we are still improving on it to see where we can fill the gaps. But uh, for production release, it's similar to what the traditional one, right? So we, uh, ops creates the uh, stack from the with the infra code, and we execute all of our regression and functional tests to make sure that it is uh, worthy for customer uh, to serve the customer. And in that way, indirectly, we do test right now. But we also have the uh, uh, like uh, infra level testing, like uh, security groups are open. That is still in progress. Uh, for for functional testing, it's uh, it's it's a web, it's a Selenium, you know, or REST API. It's infrastructure code, I think. Well, well uh, infrastructure code doesn't have. Uh, I mean, I mean. What are you changing in infrastructure code? Maybe you have uh, you have some security group change. Maybe you are you are changing something in the in the AZ level changes instance types. You are changing something some bootstrap. You are changing a, a lot of things like that are changed. So what do you want to test is a question. So uh, if I want to test my change, for example, I have completely changed the secrets management system uh, li recently. So my test is like I have to create a create a stack with the new um, secrets management system. I, everything should come up properly. I do a REST API call or whatever that uh, uh, that uh, automation that we have done, which may which makes sure that the infrastructure code uh, has brought up our entire stack completely, right, without any failure. 
So that's what we tested. Yeah, one more thing that we are experimenting is something called server spec. Uh, it's a Ruby based, uh, Cucumber based stuff, which we are experimenting to test the infrastructure. Hey, uh, you spoke about uh, uh, increasing and decreasing the size of your EBS uh, op volumes, mm -hmm. and you spoke about some automation that, that mm -hmm. was done to do it. Could you like, you know, speak a little more about that? You know, any sure. spe spe any specific libraries you used and why? And, and also, how often do you need to do something like this? Okay, so um, first coming to um, the cost optimization that we have done, so we've uh, uh, came down to around one by fourth of the cost that we have we were spending in AWS, and then wha what we have done is very simple. We are not using anything big there. So uh, every night we create a snapshot uh, of our database EBS volume, and then which is also encrypted. Um, so what we do is like we create another tag, which is the utilization of the disk. How much is di how much disk is utilized? <laughs> And then we, whenever, whenever we recreate stacks, because uh, I mean everything is dynamic. Every deployment is actually a recreation of stack for us. So whenever we recreate a stack, when you create a database, the infrastructure code looks at the utilization tag and then uh, expands the uh, volume uh, uh, if if it has reached the threshold. Uh, it's the same thing happening with uh, IOPS also. IOPS, we um, look at the IOPS or IOPS from the CloudWatch. And then um, when we create the snapshot, we say uh, what is the IOPS that is required. And then looking at the history of historical data, we actually do a 95th percentile of uh, uh, the historical data. And then we uh, uh, give the IOPS uh, ac according to that. Yeah, hi. So uh, the question is, uh, when you chose uh, stall stack, mm -hmm. uh, did you evaluate uh, Amazon service called OpsWork? We, as Intuit as a standard, uh, they were saying um, uh, OpsWork and then uh, Chef and all that. But Mint is a Python shop, and that's the reason why we went for stall stack, because it's really easy to uh, hook up um, your Python scripts and all that, and then make sure. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really good. Um, Framework, you can do anything with it. So, but uh, 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 frankly speaking, we haven't tried uh, offswear, but we w we are so happy with uh, Salt Stack. And the second question is about RDS. Mm -hmm. So uh, you mentioned multi AZ. Mm -hmm. So does that mean like it will scale or it is? We like are not using RDS, by the way. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. uh, but multi AZ. You're you were mentioning, uh, you had the slide where you uh -huh. said you should not do multi-region, but you should do multi-AZ. I didn't say don't do multi-region, but I said we are using multi-AZ because, so uh, I'll tell you what happens is, so uh, if you are spread across multi-region, the Amazon deployment model is uh, pick one uh, availability zone from each uh, region and then deploy. So there is a higher chance that you get to a buggy code if you, have, if you are on multi-availability, multi-region. And then, whereas in multi-availability zone, um, there is only 33% of chance that you are getting to a buggy code, right? And and if we are, you are got into a buggy code, 33% um, of the users are impacted, and which can be, um, you know, uh, so per hour SLAs within five minutes we get uh, that uh, snapshots, and I mean that database come up, and then all the application take up the traffic uh, in the other availability zone. And uh, last question is about uh, spot instances. Have you played around with them? If yes, what's your experience for cost saving? We didn't try. Hello. I had a, I had a same question with respect to the here. This with this. Oh, okay. I had the same question with respect to that uh, multi zone and multi region. Mm -hmm. So since we have in multi only in a single zone, right? Suppose that that particular region goes not not multi. We have in multi zones. So suppose that region goes down, so then we don't have an HA, right? Right, right. I'll, I'll, I'll come, to, come to that. So if we are in US West 2, so if California goes under the water, we are down. Uh, and the SLA that we have is eight days to get uh, mint up uh, in the other region. If California goes down, they have uh, more bigger problems to solve. So by the time we will get our stack in the other region. So uh, Frank, uh, but on a serious note, mint. Uh, is using multi-AZ, but Intuit as a company has uh, 
uh, is focusing for their high availability and disaster recovery on multi-region, but it is uh, uh, the, the operational hassles that you have is really high because we are using uh, whether it is RDS or the RDS, the problem is we don't have we don't right now have uh, an option to en uh, to uh, replicate encrypted data uh, between regions. And the other problem with snapshot, you have a snapshot which is in the which is in one region which is not accessible in the other region. So you have to uh, you have to ship your snapshot um, from one region, which is a region-wise copy that you have to do, which takes a long time, right? So. Uh, Cost-wise and operational-wise, it is really difficult as of now. But a practical scenario, um, one region completely going down is really, really remote. And our SLA for that is eight days. So on the, on the time front, uh, I think right now they have launched something called uh, on an S3, if you store the snapshot, uh, they have this cross S3 replication. Yes. So that actually happens really fast. Well, uh, we have databases of uh, like 800 gigabyte and all that, which is which is which takes quite a good time actually. Like uh, last time when I tried three months back, it was around six hours for me, uh, which is not acceptable uh, for uh, for a high availability. All right, thank you. Yeah, um, sticking to the AZ and uh, region question again. Uh, I work with SAP Labs, so we're in a similar boat when it comes to handling data. Encrypted data is a must. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there are also legal requirements that come into picture for especially financial data. Mm -hmm. uh, a customer who's from the EU, for example, will say, no, I don't want my data to go and sit in mm -hmm. the US. So mm -hmm. uh, this is more a product issue than a technical issue. Mm -hmm. uh, I got it. But where are you in that stage? I just want so to. So we curious. are not global yet, but uh, we are. We have that in our pipeline. But what we have decided to go is serve from the region where they are from. So that's one reason. Uh, if you look at my, uh, if you have uh, seen my motivation slide, we wanted to glo go global and then to span our data centers there. You have to have AWS kind of thing because it's really difficult to set up a physical data center if you want. I think uh, I'm almost done. Thank you, Sajun.